If you have your Bibles, let's open them together. Uh, we'll turn to the book of Revelation and chapter 12. The book of Revelation and chapter 12. You will remember in our study together over the past several weeks, we have seen, first of all, we saw the seven seals, you remember. And these seven seals took us from the rapture of the saints to the second coming of Christ, and then it brought us back to the uh, midway point of the tribulation period, where that we then saw the, the seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets, you remember, took us from the midway point of the tribulation period, brought us to the second coming of Christ, and then it carried us forward into the into the millennial kingdom of Christ. And so those were the seven trumpets. And then we saw, uh, just over the past couple of weeks, we saw the seven vials or the seven bowls. And these took us again from the midway point of the tribulation to the second coming of Christ. You remember we saw these were actually followed after the trumpets. It was an escalation of the judgment that the trumpet brought when men still did not repent, then a, a vial or a bowl of judgment was poured out to escalate it. And so it carried us from the midway point of the tribulation to the second coming and then, and then carried us forward to the battle of Armageddon. Well, now we're going to come through it one more time. We're going to come through this tribulation period one more time and we're going to actually have a fourth view of the second coming of Christ. And that really shouldn't surprise us, should it? We were given four views of His first coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So, And now we've got four views of, of the second coming here in the book of Revelation. And so as we look at these things together, we're going to see how that this is going to actually be shown to us by revealing to us seven personalities. Seven personalities. Now, in the Bible... You remember many times prophecies are not really in a chronological order. Uh, sometimes they skip gaps. And, and uh, for example, when the Old Testament prophets saw the first coming of Christ, and then they immediately saw the mountaintop of the second coming of Christ, they didn't even see the church age because it was like a valley. So they, they just saw the mountain peaks. And so sometimes that's the way prophecy is. And so these personalities, they're not going to come in a chronological order. But, but as we compare Scripture with Scripture, I think that we will see how these personalities not only fit together, but how they overlap one another and, and, and bring us then to... Uh, to the end times, and we'll see the parts that they have to play. So let's begin by noticing, number one, we're going to see the woman. Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 1. The woman. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 1, and there appeared a great wonder. Now this great wonder, commonly in our Bible, it is referred to as a sign. It's a sign. So there appears a great wonder in heaven, and it is a woman. It is a woman. Now the identity of this woman and the importance of her identity cannot be overstated. It's very important that we get this right. Very important we get this right. In fact, one writer said this. He said, Israel is the cornerstone of prophecy, and if you have her rightly placed, the whole prophetic superstructure will be erected accurately. So with that in mind, let's notice, let's notice this woman. And, and again, we need to be careful here because there are some who will say that this woman is the church. Okay, uh, Some will say this woman is the Virgin Mary. And, and there's other ideas that have been, that have been uh, given. But, but let's look at the Bible, see what the Bible says concerning the identity of this woman. And we're going, to see, we're going to see three things about her that will, I think, very clearly reveal who this, who this woman is. So let's notice, first of all, her, her identity. Revelation chapter 12, verse number 1. The Bible says concerning this woman that she is, she's clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of... Twelve stars. 
Now immediately, if we think back to the Old Testament, and we think back to that prophetic dream that Joseph had, and you can read about it in Genesis 37, <coughs> excuse me, verse 9 and verse 10. Joseph had that dream, and you remember he saw, he saw his father, Jacob, and, and his father was likened to the son. Okay? And, and he saw his mother, Rachel, and, and, and there in Genesis, she's likened to the moon. And, and then you see his brothers, the sons of Jacob, uh, they are likened to the stars, you see. They're likened to the stars. Bottom line, from looking at Genesis and what we find described here in Revelation, pretty clear that this woman is in fact the nation of Israel. This woman is the nation of Israel. And and it becomes even clearer when we see not only her identity, but we see her child. Notice her child in Revelation chapter 12, verse 2. It says, and, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And then we find down in verse number 5, the Bible says, and she brought forth a man child. Who is this man child? Well, it's obviously the Lord Jesus Christ. How, how do we know that? Well, let's keep reading. This man-child is going to be one who will rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, we've talked about that before. Clearly, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. So this man-child is the one who's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And, and, and after 33 and a half years of ministry on this earth, her child was caught up unto God and to His throne. So there's her child. We see her identity. We see her child. Let her see. We see her danger. We see her danger. Now we saw before how the Antichrist, you remember, is going to make a he's going to make a seven year covenant. Remember that with the nation of Israel. He, he's going to come down and he's going to be he's going to be talking peace, safety. He's going to come carrying a bow, but he doesn't have any arrows. He's going to come talking peace. He's going to come talking safety. And he's going to rebuild their temple. And he's going to restart their sacrificial system. And he's going to do all these things for the, for the nation of Israel. But at the midway point, Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 27, this Antichrist is going to break his covenant. Daniel calls it, breaking it in the middle of the week. And so he's going to break that covenant that he has made with, with the nation of Israel. And, and not only is he going to break the covenant, he's going to seek to destroy her. And therefore, the Lord Jesus gave a very, a very dire prophecy. And, and Matthew chapter 24, talking about the end times, here's what the Lord Jesus said. He said, When ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. In other words, this is that middle part of the tribulation when the Antichrist is literally going to enter into the temple. He's going to go into the Holy of Holies. He's going to declare Himself to be God. And Jesus said, when you see that, when you see that abomination of desolation that Daniel foretold, whoso readeth, let him understand. Better pay attention. Better pay attention. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. In other words, get out of Jerusalem. It's going to be dangerous. It's going to be dangerous. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, we find the same thing is spoken of again. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days. Thirty days to the Jewish month. This equals 42 months or three and a half years. In other words, God is going to take care of His people in this mountain place for the final three and a half years of that great tribulation period. Uh, the mountains, 
the wildernesses in these passages are, are clearly identified for us by, by the prophet Daniel. He's, he's speaking of different kings. He's talking about different kingdoms. And we've seen this before. But then Daniel comes to Daniel chapter 9, verse number 40. And he says, at the, at the time of the end. In other words, he comes to the kingdom of the Antichrist. He comes to the kingdom of the Antichrist. And here's what Daniel says in Daniel chapter 11, verse number 41. Concerning the Antichrist, he shall enter also into the glorious land. Glorious land. That's the land of milk and honey. That's the land of Palestine. That's the land of Israel. He's going to enter into the glorious land. And many countries shall be overthrown. Remember, he's going, to, he's going to rule the nations of the world, right? But notice it. But these shall escape out of his hand. Who are they? Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now it's interesting if you do a little geographical study here, you'll find that that Edom and Moab and Ammon are all located where? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? They're located in Jordan. They're located in the land of Jordan, in the country of Jordan, south of the Dead Sea. And, And because these... Islamic areas are going to stand against the Antichrist. It, it would, it, the Muslims are not going to bow to the Antichrist. They're going to stand against him. And so as a result of that, their land is actually going to become a safe haven for these Jews who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe the actual place, if you look at Micah chapter 2, verse 12, the actual place, you remember David went down and he hid in the caves and all of that when King Saul was after him. Well, I believe the actual place where he's going to take care of his people and protect them for that three and a half years of great tribulation, Micah chapter 2, verse 12, it'll be those caves around the ancient city where Petra was built. In fact, that's what the Apostle Paul, that's, I'm sorry, the Apostle John, that, that, that's, that's basically what he describes for us. In Revelation 12, verse number 14, he says, And to the woman were given two great wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished. She's fed. She's fed. Just like God fed the children of Israel in the wilderness with manna. God's going to feed His people in this place. And how long is He going to do that for? For a time and times... And a half a time, that's three and a half years, from the face of the serpent. So God is going to protect, He's going to protect His people, this woman, the nation of Israel. We see how she's going to, how she's going to go through this, this tribulation period. Now that brings us to the next personality we want to notice uh, that's brought out in our text, and that is the dragon. The dragon. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 3, and there appeared another wonder or another sign, okay? There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. A great red dragon. Notice a couple of things about the dragon. First of all, let's notice his appearance. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, continuing... This great red dragon, notice he has, he has seven heads, and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. So let's notice this. Let's take these three things, break them down in a little bit. He's going to have seven heads. Seven heads. Now, that sounds like a monstrosity. Until you look at Revelation chapter 17 and verse number 9, and you find an interpretation is given. Revelation chapter 17 verse 9 tells us that these seven heads are actually seven mountains. These seven heads, they're seven mountains. In other words, this gives us his geographical location and his base of operations. It gives us his geographical location, his base of operations. Now, I went to a very trusted source. Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia. Uh, According to Wikipedia, there are a whole list 
of cities that are known as being built on seven hills. There, I mean, there's a whole list of them from, from all around the world. Uh, all, all kinds of cities that are identified as being built on seven hills. But from that list, I, I believe from other passages of Scripture that Rome is the city that is being referred to. Rome is the city of seven hills where Satan is going to set up his base of operation. Uh, Not only does he have seven heads, we also find he has ten horns. Ten horns. Now if you do a study of Bible numerology, and and we talked about that a little bit in our last semester in hermeneutics, uh, Bible hermeneutics and and, and numerology, uh, we learned that ten is the number of the Gentile. Ten is the number of the Gentile. So ten horns means, uh, and of course horns, are that, that is the power that you see in, in goats and cows and all of that. They, they push with their horn. It, it's, it's a symbol of power. So these ten horns means that this dragon is actually going to rule through ten Gentile nations. He's going to rule through ten Gentile nations. And he'll be, able, he'll be able to do that because of the fact he also has seven crowns. Seven is the number of what? Seven is the number of completion. Seven is the number of perfection. And so he's going to be able to rule because not only is he going to have ten horns, but he's going to have complete, absolute authority and control. This is the dragon. This is the appearance of the dragon. But then I want you to notice not only his appearance, just in case we're still not sure, uh, the Bible is going to give us his identity in very clear terms. Verse number 9, And the great dragon was, okay, here, here he is, here he is, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth, the whole world. That, that's who this dragon is. That's who this dragon is. And I want you to know that Satan is uh, Satan's smart. Don't, don't think you can match wits with the devil. You'll come out on the short end every time. Satan is smart. Satan is powerful. But the good news is, is that Satan is not omniscient. He, he, he knows more than you do, but he doesn't know everything. And he's more powerful than you, but he's not all powerful. He's not as powerful as God. Those attributes of omniscience and omnipotence, those are, those are attributes that belong to God alone. So, so how does Satan rule in the world? And, and how will he rule over all of those nations uh, during this time of, of tribulation? Well, if you'll remember that before the creation... In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 to verse 24, uh, Lucifer, Lucifer, Satan, desired to put his throne above the throne of God. He, He wanted to receive the worship that belongs to God alone. And so he wanted to be just like the Most High. That was his stated desire. He wants to be just like the Most High. But when his attempted coup failed, and and when he was overthrown, the Bible says in Revelation 12, 4, we find an interesting thing. It says that his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. That third part of the stars means a third of God's angels actually followed Satan in his rebellion. They actually followed Satan in his rebellion. And that's why. That, that's why the Apostle Paul declared in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12, here's the situation we face. Uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You, you see, the bottom line is, through those demonic spirits... Satan seeks to control people. He seeks to control nations, even today. And he's going to continue to do that. He's going to continue to control people and nations of the world during the tribulation period. Let her see his deception. His deception. From the very beginning, 
From the very beginning in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to verse number 14, as we've already noted, Satan has desired to receive for himself the worship that belongs to God. But you need to understand that desire has not changed. That desire is still the same today. And we've noted that Satan's base of operations is going to be headquartered in Rome or, as it's referred to in Revelation 17 verse 5, Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. And from there, Satan's lie will go out to all of those who knew the truth, but they hated the truth. They, they knew the truth, but they rejected the truth. And Satan's lie is going to go out to them and, and, and they're going to be deceived. And here's the reason why. They'll be deceived because they desired the pleasures of unrighteousness more than they love God. And therefore, just as he did with the Pharaoh of Egypt... God is going to harden their hearts. God will harden the hearts of those wicked men so that they will be deceived by Satan's lie. In fact, the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, he explains it this way. He says that God will send them strong delusion that they will believe a lie. Why would God do that? Here's the reason why. That they all might be damned. And why is that? Because they love sin more than they love God. They love the pleasures of sin more than they love God. Their priority was always satisfying self, never about pleasing God. And so because of that, God's going to let them reap the consequences of their choices. But that brings us to another question. And the question is simply this, how is this lie, how is it going to be propagated? How is it going to spread? How is this lie going to spread? Well, that brings us to the third personality that we want to notice. And that's the whore. The whore. Revelation. In Revelation chapter uh, 12, we find this one is, is very clearly mentioned. And by the way, let me just remind you that in the study of, of the Old Testament, many times you will find how that the terms adultery, fornication, and idolatry are used synonymously. In fact, even in the New Testament, remember we're warned, we're warned that we are not to be adulterers and adulteresses. He's not talking about sexual sin. He's talking about idolatry. Putting things before God. Allowing the things of the world to be more important to us than the things of God. But, but they're not always, again, th- these terms not always used in the physical sense. They're used to describe the spiritual unfaithfulness of the people and the nations that have turned away from God to follow after idols. For example, in, in, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21, it, it's quite interesting that, that even the city of Jerusalem, what some would call the holy city, right? The city of Jerusalem. Uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21, uh, Jerusalem is called a harlot because she's filled with idolatry. She, she's referred to as a harlot because of her unfaithfulness to the Lord God by her idolatries. In fact, the Lord God said this in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1, concerning, concerning Jerusalem, Thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. You've played the harlot with many lovers. And now in our text, that same terminology is used to describe the city of Rome, the, 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 the religion of Rome as Satan's whore. Revelation chapter 17, verse 18. And as we consider this wicked woman, uh, I want us to mention just a couple of things very quickly. First of all, let's notice her beginning. I'd like to recommend that you read a book. It's, it's by Alexander Hislop. It's, it's a classic work. It's a scholarly work. And it's called The Two Babylons. It's called The Two Babylons. And in this book, he he documents 
He documents very well how the idea of worshiping a mother and child began way back in the city of Babel. And he goes on to show how that within a thousand years, this idea of worshiping a mother and child, a goddess and her child, uh, he shows how that this spread worldwide. Within a thousand years, it is everywhere. So that eventually, even Israel began to make cakes that they offered to the Queen of Heaven. Jeremiah 7.18 And they also began to burn incense, Jeremiah 44, verse 17, to the Queen of Heaven. Interesting. That's why she's called in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5, the mother of harlots. The mother of harlots. This is the beginning. Notice her influence. Her influence. In Revelation 17, 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, we're explained, uh, this is explained for us in in Revelation 17, 15, where, where he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest. Where the whore sitteth. What are these waters? Well, here's what they are. They are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues or languages. That, that, that's, who, that's who she is. That's who she is. In fact, it's interesting that in 1825, in the year 1825, Pope Leo the Twelfth, Pope Leo the Twelfth actually had a coin minted. He, he, he minted a coin, and, and on that coin, on the front side, it was a picture of himself. And, and, and then on the, on the reverse side, or the back side, the church is pictured as a woman seated on a globe with a cup in her hand. And, and the inscription there, it's in Latin, it's, it's set it super universum, and, and it simply means the world is her seat. The world is her seat. And by her worldwide influence, Revelation 17, verse number 2, this wicked woman has led kings and peoples to join in her spiritual fornication. And this wicked woman has made kings and peoples drunk with the blood of the wine of her fornication. But the fact is, her greatest influence is still in the future. Her greatest influence is still going to be in the future. Revelation 17 and verse number 3, And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is the same beast that we saw before in chapter 13 verse 1 when we talked about Remember we talked about the little horn? Remember the little horn? That's the Antichrist. When he comes on the scene, this wicked woman is going to be riding him. She's going to be riding this Antichrist. In other words, just like a jockey gets on a horse and he controls that horse, he guides that horse exactly where he wants him to be, this wicked woman is going to be controlling the Antichrist and she's going to be leading him to a place of world power and world dominion. She's going to come riding on the beast. Not only do we see, not only do we see her, her influence, notice, notice we also see in verse number 4, we see her wealth. Her wealth. Volumes have been written on the wealth of Roman Catholic Church. Volumes have been written on her wealth. Uh, Not only did we see it speak of her wealth, we also see that it speaks of her murders. Revelation chapter 17, verse 6. In fact, the Bible says that she is is drunk. She's drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs. We we see her her murders. And and, and then we also see, we're also going to see her demise. Her demise. Now let's go back to that illustration we used a minute ago about a jockey controlling a horse. Question. Who's really in control? I mean, think about it. 
Uh, jockeys these days, they weigh about 43 kilograms. You know? They're just basically little skinny guys. And, uh, and, and not real big. And, and, and the horses that they're on weigh about almost 500 kilograms. And, and so the reality, I mean, just be honest. Who's in control? Who's in control? Uh, the truth is, the jockey is only in control as long as the horse is willing to be controlled. All right? I mean, when that horse gets it in his head, he's going to the barn. Guess where the jockey's going to go? <laughs> he's going to the barn, right? Uh, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. We, we, we understand that. That makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. The only thing the jockey can do is just hang on. Just hang on. But there's going to come a time, and it's going to come around the middle of the tribulation. There's going to come a time around the middle of the tribulation when this beast, the woman has been riding him, and she's, she's led him to a place of power and, 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 and all of that. But, but there's coming a time about the middle of the tribulation, uh, this beast is going to turn against the woman seeking to control him. Revelation 17, verse 16 and verse 17 He is going to destroy her. He's going to destroy her. Well, we're out of time. And we'll have to continue with this next time. But let me just remind you of of a dangerous fact that sometimes we, I think we forget. Let me just remind you of the fact that Satan is not opposed to religion. He is not opposed to religion. In fact, religion is the most effective tool in Satan's arsenal for damning the souls of men and women. Satan's not against religion. He's all in favor of it. As long as you're not worshiping the true and the living God. See? And so do not be deceived into thinking that religion will take you to heaven. Or that religion will take your family to heaven, or your friends to heaven, or your colleagues to heaven. Now, don't be deceived into thinking that, that being sincerely religious is going to have any spiritual value when it comes to your eternal standing before God. We, we need to be constantly reminding ourselves that it's only by faith in Jesus Christ that we have assurance of heaven. Remember what Jesus said, I am. What? the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by Me. And so, and so let's, let's, keep that, let's keep that in our hearts and in our minds as we seek to be a witness and a testimony to those who are around us. Heavenly Father, we thank You this evening for Your Word and we pray that You would, you would take these thoughts and, and Lord, I, I realize we, we've covered a lot. We've covered it quickly. But Lord, I pray that uh, You just help us to understand uh, just how serious things are going to be once we are taken out of this world and the Antichrist begins to come on the scene and all of the, all of the things that are going to go on and during that time, certainly what a terrible time it's going to be. And so Lord, help us to be right now while we have the opportunity. Help us to be the witness that we ought to be for You. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.